Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 6, Professional Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 10, Global Logistics Strategy, and it's Learning Outcome 3, which is to understand the concept of reverse logistics and its impact on global logistics strategy. So we're going to look at the concept and requirements of reverse logistics, along with the strategic factors that influence reverse logistics. Contrast the factors that influence strategic reverse logistics and compare the factors that implement reverse logistics strategy. So reverse logistics is the process of moving or transporting goods from their final destination for the purpose of capturing value in terms of reuse, manufacturing, refurbishing, recycling or proper disposal. The effective and efficient management of the material flow is crucial. Used products or products at the end of their lives are then returned to a collection point where an evaluation of its state is undertaken. And those products can either be repaired, refurbished, remanufactured or recycled. Any products or components that are assessed as waste are sent for disposal. Reverse logistics systems can be classified into four types. You've got product recovery systems, reverse logistics systems, product return networks, and enterprise return management systems. But effective reverse logistics systems can lead to improved customer satisfaction, reduced resource investment levels, reduced, reduced distribution and storage costs, and a recapturing of the value. The, 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 the recovery of the products for repair configuration or remanufacturing can significantly um, return profit for the business as an opportunity. And it can also positively influence customer satisfaction and service because such ability to effectively and promptly handle returns and repairs could be seen as um, a positive to a customer. But manufacturers execute reverse logistic programs to achieve cost savings, achieve a better reputational profile, secure competitive advantage, improve environmental protection, and comply with legislation. So in this section, waste reduction will be discussed because it's an important reason for organisations to implement reverse logistics programmes. But increasingly, managers recognise the overconsumption of resources and pollution as waste. And there's growing pressure on organisations to pay attention to the resources and environmental impacts of the products and services they offer, as well as the processes they deploy in producing and distributing them. So unlike forward flows, reverse logistics is generally seen as a cost centre that requires tight cost control as well as waste reduction. And modern approaches to global manufacturing and supply chain activities require organisations to reduce and manage the impact and effects of their supply chain and operational activities on the world's ecological system and social systems. That includes environmental and social environments in which an organisation operates. So, for instance, the furniture manufacturer IKEA now have programmes developed to reduce the number of trees and forests consumed in their furniture manufacturing process and reduction in waste in the use of trees and forest products. They now plant two trees for each tree it cuts down in its production process. And waste is a type of cost and reduction in the waste results in a reduction of cost. So the term waste represents a valuable resource consumed in the process of sourcing, as well as the manufacturing, delivery and packaging in the product. And those things don't necessarily add any value. But examples of waste include the employees, the equipment, the raw materials and time. These are resources consumed but don't add value. So such waste need to be eliminated because they constitute a source of un unnecessary costs. And one way that you could um, think about this is using the seven wastes by Tashio Ono or the Tinwood transport inventory motion, 
weighting, overproduction, overprocessing, and defects. Now, reverse logistics is not the same as a closed loop supply chain. Closed loop supply chains are also known as the cradle to cradle. It's designed and managed right from the start to consider both forward and reverse flows in the supply chain with minimal leakage and loss. So it views materials as the nutrients that circulate in closed loops. Everything is used, nothing is wasted. Reverse logistics encompasses the activities that bring products, components and materials from the point of consumption back to the point of origin. And that's not the same as waste management because waste has no value and therefore no use. Green logistics is related to reducing the carbon consumption and emissions in production and transport processes. It aims to protect the environment from carbon and from other sources in, of pollution in logistics and supply chain processes. But why is the concept becoming more influential? Reverse logistics is a process of moving or transporting goods from their final destination for the purpose of capturing value or for proper disposal. And sometimes the final destination may be the end user or the consumer or an organization or intermediate user, which at the point of consumption. Likewise, something, um, <clears throat> sometimes it's the point of origin actually, that may manufacture, retail or designate a place of capturing value or where proper disposal takes place, like a recycling facility. So the reverse flows <clears throat> have always occurred in supply chains for decades. Retailers of consumer goods, such as home appliances and electronics, together will transport what they have had to deal with in terms of damaged goods that are returned by customers. And often transport companies and returns warehouses sell these damaged goods to salvage operators who ultimately resell the goods. Similarly, bottled beverages had to re refill empty bottles for a small deposit that has been paid and refunded to the customer. In the passenger aviation sector, <clears throat> passenger jet engines have to be repaired and recycled from time to time for airlines to meet the mandatory safety requirements. And large engine manufacturers like Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney, or General Electric receive, repair and recycle engines for major global airlines. Nonetheless, in the last couple of decades, interest in the concept has grown tremendously. And the concept is much more influential globally for a number of reasons. The unique characteristics of reverse logistics versus the forward logistics has drawn greater interest from businesses and researchers. And it's a global inc increase in the focus on the reverse flows because of the simple reason that there is an enormous increase in the need for them. So some of the things that we'll now need to consider are product returns. There's been an enormous rise in the product returns and an increase uh, continues to grow at a fast rate. So sometimes things that are sold will be returned because of a customer complaint. Customer wants a refund or an exchange due to the need for recycling. And that's increasing because of things like online returns. They're growing and al are almost double the rate of counter sale returns. Unsatisfied customers, they want to take advantage of the money back guarantee. Or overstocks by of goods by retailers. So sometimes they want to return some of the unsold stock. Product replacement or end of cycle. I think once the product reaches the end of its life cycle, producers seek to promptly remove it from its shelves to present uh, uh, or prevent, should I say, cannibalization of sales of the new version. Sometimes manufacturers recall the products because there's been a an issue and environmental concerns for the green factors and economic considerations. So manufacturers take back their products at the end of their life. And it should also help you to reduce the risk of obsolescence and, and shorter product life cycles. 
You've got to think also about the repairs and maintenance. You know, this is a significant facet of customer support. The activity of repairing or maintaining goods that have been sold. So it might be required in order to return a good backwardly from customer to manufacturer. So it can be repaired or maintained. You've got the reuse. So product reuse occurs when a product or material is put back to work. It could be for a new purpose or for its original purpose. It doesn't require major remanufacturing. So an example of product reuse is when a customer returns used packaging like bubble wrap and boxes. There are many other products that can be reused like pallets, inkjet cartridges for printers, bottles, cans. And the reuse has its advantages. It saves consumption of energy and raw materials. You've got the end of life returns. Um, <clears throat> so when things come to its end of life, um, it's important that there's a way that we can put that back to its original um, place where it came from. And some examples could be things like plastic toys given to children in fast food restaurants, mobile phones that are typically three years old. And depending on the seller and the end of life return, it may differ from the end of service life which is when a seller or, or a manufacturer would no longer provide troubleshooting, maintenance or other services. And then lastly, for recycling and dismantling, some products can be recovered, recycled and used as raw materials for further manufacturing, like scrap metals and plastic. Now, strategic factors that influence the design and implementation of reverse logistics need to be analysed and discussed in this section, but they are usually industry specific. And we're going to look at some of the general factors here that would um, influence the design and implementation of this reverse logistic programmes. From a strategic perspective, we'll look at the costs, the quality, the customer service, the environmental concerns and the legislative concerns. Operationally, again, we're looking for cost benefit analysis, transport, warehousing, supplier management, and the remanufacturing, recycling and repackaging. So it does provide strategic cost savings, unlike the unusual quick fix cost saving method, like laying off staff. You know, if you, if you evaluate your productivity and profitability, productivity is the measure of the ratio of outputs to inputs. And no supply chain can be productive without a systematic process to manage the material movements. So reverse logistics can increase an organization's productivity and profitability by using lower cost inputs and unused inputs that would have otherwise been wasted. Now, governments implement regulatory policies like laws to intervene in the behavior of society which does include business. And the reason for this is to address environmental concerns and recycling issues. So government policy and legislation about environmental protection has increased in the recent decades. So we could refer to examples about the EU legislation. There are many of them that you can see on the screen. Um, today, so the EU emissions trading, the waste incineration, haste, uh, hazardous waste, urban waste, water. I mean, there, there, are, there are a few of them there that um, individual states and local governments have, have put in place, but some also locally will have their own legislation and policies as well. So organisations that operate around the world will need to comply with the environmental laws and policies of each country that they operate in, which clearly makes that more complex. But organisations, um, they have to deal with the bureaucratic systems of the regulators and the need to report on compliance. And they need to stand the risk of hefty fines and even a shutdown if they don't comply with such laws. This would be accompanied by reputational damage. So organisations increasingly pursue economic value from their reverse logistics. 
It was defined earlier as the process of moving or transporting goods from their final destination for the purpose of capturing value or for proper disposal. So we're looking at the pursuit of value and other economic benefits as an important factor in reverse logistics. Now, the Council of Logistics Management published a report in which they argue that ec economic motivations are increasingly becoming the rationale for executing reverse logistics. Not necessarily because it's demanded or required by the customer. And that's second only to the government environmental policy and legislation. In essence, operational activities within reverse logistics, like recycling and reuse and remanufacturing, are excellent opportunities to make profits and build a value stream. Then we've got the triple bottom line, an accounting framework with three dimensions of organisation performance, sometimes referred to as the three P's. So the three P's are the people, the planet and the profit. And this is an accounting framework that was devised by John Elkington, I think it was 1997. And the concept came about as a result of the belief that businesses can achieve their economic goals, social goals and environmental goals concurrently. And we must just move away from focusing on reporting our performance on profit only. Surely we can report on the impact we have on the planet or the people. So the triple bottom line contributes to sustainability of the environment, of social systems and of economic livelihoods of firms, societies and communities. There's no consensus on how to measure the triple bottom line in practice, but there are examples of factors that can be measured. The economic dimension is the amount of taxes paid or the knowledge competitiveness that can be measured. You know, how much profit did you make? Has that gone up, down, stayed the same? We can look at gross profit, net profits and all sorts of financial indicators. From a social or people perspective, you could look at the average hours that you're training employees and any charitable contributions that can be measured, gender pay gap, the split between part-time, full-time, male, female, um, and many other things. And from an environmental dimension or the planet start, the side, it's the amount of waste that you're producing, materials that you're recycling, energy you're consuming, all of those things can be measured. Now, corporate social responsibility has received a lot of attention in the last two decades from businesses, as well as researchers and the public. This concept is, concept is very similar to the triple bottom line, but there is no consensus of a definition. It can be seen from a var variety of perspectives and many conceptions of CSR have been proposed. For example, it could be seen as conveying responsibility or liability. It may be seen as socially responsible behavior in an ethical sense, but it could also be seen as philanthropy by organizations or a charitable contribution. Others think it may mean the organisation being socially conscious. So the term is often used um, in the context of being proper or valid, or in the context of belonging. So the conceptualisation and definition of CSR makes it clear that managers must bear several responsibilities towards a number of different stakeholders in their day-to-day -day actions. But it's also clear that these activities comprise four levels of organisational manager responsibility. The economic responsibility about being profitable. The philanthropic responsibilities of being a good citizen. Complying with the law and being ethically responsible. Green logistics may be described as various approaches to measuring and minimising the adverse environmental impacts of your logistics activities. But green, green logistics provides a unique insight on the environmental impacts of logistics and the actions that companies and governments can take to deal with such unwanted impacts. They will include things like reverse and forward flows of goods, services and information between their originating port and the point of consumption. 
It may apply to activities like transportation, so the carbon emissions of diesel trucks, the warehousing and storage, the sourcing. But the goal for green logistics is to create a sustainable firm value while balancing your economic and environmental efficiency. So the term green logistics is used to describe logistics approaches and systems that use advanced equipment and technology to reduce environmental damage in their operations. So an organization's reverse flows and logistics activities are gonna be influenced by several external factors. Examples are our customers. They're becoming more conscious of environmental concerns. They're demanding that organizations become more environmentally responsible. The suppliers, they will want to be associated with organizations that recognize and take action to protect the environment. Competitors, more and more organizations are offering return services for their customers, and therefore organizations are competing against those that either offer it or don't. You've got pressure groups as well, groups without political power that can influence the government and businesses to achieve their objectives. But they can also influence how you're perceived as an organization. And we should liaise with these groups and include their reverse logistics programs when doing so. Society and the media, you know, people across the world are becoming increasingly aware of the need to protect the environment. The media features news about the challenges faced around the world on matters like global warming. So we do need to become socially and environmentally responsible or risk losing your reputation and customers to their competitors. And finally, government bodies and regulators, often referred to as institutional drivers. They set out the laws and therefore influence organizations by requiring compliance with the law. Regulatory institutions motivate companies to execute reverse logistic programs and other environmental initiatives. But having environmental regulations can act as an incentive and motivator for organizations to take action and undertake reverse logistics or other environmental initiatives. So the decision to undertake reverse logistics and the activities to successfully achieve logistics could be influenced by legislation and regulators and organizations requ are required to comply with the law. But to achieve compliance can be costly, but the positive side is that organizations will be motivated to carry out that reverse logistics and environmental initiatives, which will improve the reputation in the eyes of their customer. Customer demand or customer satisfaction have been frequently cited as an important goal for reverse logistics, but satisfying other stakeholders like manufacturers and governments are also important goals. So we need to work to resolve customer returns, complaints and defective products. It should be a top priority in maintaining an organization's customer base and presenting a positive reputation. If you make the process user-friendly and clear, uh, and for the customer reducing their waiting times, um, this will be in turn a good outcome for you. And then incentives. You know, organizations are starting to realize managing reverse logistics needs to be a core capability. And many are using sort of advanced technology that are developed by the electronics and automotive industries to support the reverse logistic process. The incentive for us to manage reverse logistics are many. It can reduce cost, increase revenue and help retain our loyalty of our customers through providing better experiences and satisfaction. It can protect the brand. It can help us respond more quickly to changes in customers and demands. And we can manage the cost and availability of our inventory. Overall, costs are reduced, particularly in organisations where returned products can be remanufactured or recycled. But a further incentive is that the organization can maximize its return on assets by managing its reverse logistics properly. We're now going to look at some examples of internal factors, which could include environmental concerns that relate to the environmental factors like climate change, pollution, 
weather and the availability of resources. The drivers of product recovery will include commercial, environmental and legislative and economic aspects. The strategy cost benefits are next. So a cost benefit analysis should be carried out to identify the net benefit of reverse logistics before committing to it. Volume and quality returns relate to the amount of resources in terms of cost, time and personnel required to execute reverse logistics. And having dedicated resources for reverse logistics requires the commitment from senior management. Resources. The resource in reverse logistics is the logistics management of the goods and services back through the supply chain from their final destination back to the point of origin. Integration and coordination. For reverse logistics to be effective, it must be integrated and coordinated with other processes. Senior management are responsible for setting goals and ensuring they are integrated into each function and process. Internal concerns and awareness of legislation. I mean, the legislation itself is an external factor, but the impact of non-compliance is an internal factor. Non-compliance will have impacted on the environment and the organization's reputation. So achieving compliance is an incentive and a motivator for organizations to execute reverse logistics. And then finally, commitment to reverse logistics. Decision makers, senior managers and all employees need to be committed to environmental issues and ethical standards. So managers should review reverse logistics as a resource when carrying out efficiently and effectively recognizing that it can add value to the supply chain. Now we'll look at the reverse logistics strategy. <clears throat> Senior management has ultimately got the responsibility for setting meaningful goals for the reverse logistics system. And they should convey the priorities of an organization to its stakeholders and its constituents. But these goals are then entrenched into other functions and process areas. As individual workers determine how their work processes contribute to the attainment of firms goals in an area of reverse logistics. But you must establish performance metrics for the logistics activities and processes. So thinking about what is measured relates to the desired goals and outcomes. But within each transaction, there are two participants, the customer returning the product and the supplier accepting the return. And the customer and supplier may have very different perspectives and interests in that transaction. The customer is only going to be interested in a quick refund or a credit or replacement item. The organisation accepting the return may be interested in processing the return quickly in order to extract the residual value. There are some barriers to implementing reverse logistics strategy, like no infrastructure or insufficient resources. Lack of knowledge and expert human power that's required to develop, execute and manage the required reverse flow program. Insufficient materials and information systems to support the program. And difficult in forecasting the flow and consumption. That could be as a result of operational deficiencies. And this can be seen negatively and affect how um, flow planning and management and result in inefficient cost systems, or it might be seen as not a priority. But if senior managers do not give reverse logistics the priority it deserves, it would not be allocated sufficient attention in terms of resources, and it will increase the risk of failure. It could be driven by legislation and not identified business value. And if business value is not identified, then there will be no genuine commitment to reverse logistics within the organization. Municipal, local, state and federal restrictions and or regulators can serve as barriers to the implementation of your reverse logistics strategy. And the economic value added by contracting a third party logistics provider to manage the logistics process needs to be really carefully considered. It's regarded as an additional cost, you know, the day to day operational cost, the value of the value to the business may not be recognized. And finally, unpopular 
as regarded as a sign of failure. There is a perception that if an organization takes back products from the market instead of selling it to the market, that this is a sign of failure. Now, reverse logistics has unique characteristics that create unique requirements. For instance, the reverse process collects from several different sources and locations. Rather than a single supplier or a few suppliers for one product. In addition, there is a critical mass and economic quality issue. How much is considered adequate from a quantity volume perspective to justify the expense of retrieving the product? And as discussed before, the volatility in supply is greater in reverse logistics channels due to the many uncertainties and complexities with each product and its material life. So Mead and Sarkis proposed four categories of consideration for to facilitate the selection of the appropriate free PL partner and for implementing your reverse logistics strategy. The decision tree may also be used to enable structural and systematic decision making while considering the four categories. So you need to think about the product's position in its life cycle. So is it in the introduction, the growth, the maturity or the decline? Products in the early phases of the life cycle may not be required, um, or they may not require significant storage space, but might require collections. Then you've got the organization's strategic performance criteria. That's usually um, criteria such as a conventional strategy, high quality, less time consumed, least cost and highest flexibility. And then reverse logistics process functions. Think about the ability of that provider to potentially deliver the operational reverse logistic process functions, such as the collection package, the storage, transition processing and additional assembly and delivery. And then the final role of logistics, um, reverse logistics in the organization. You know, you must be able to reclaim the product if sole purpose is to reclaim the product for storage, reuse or other activities that may not be taken care of by reverse logistics, you may be able to recycle it, remanufacture it, reuse it, or take it back for another purpose or dispose of it in the, in the way that it was intended. Now, the best practice features of third party logistic providers in managing reverse logistics is firstly with their advanced IT capabilities. This is heavily dependent on IT processes and a result of the need for to improve the visibility of the products in motion through the reverse supply chain. So you're going to use things like cloud based computers, EDI, that's electronic data interchange or ERPs, um, radio frequency ID, barcodes, track and trace visibility. You then need the coordination and collaboration. That's with every member in the supply chain, including the customers and the suppliers. The supply chain orchestration. You know, third party logistics providers are going to follow best practice and hold a strategic role as an orchestrator. And that requires a holistic view of the full service in reverse logistics and the closed loop supply chain. So the orchestration is defined as the activities of managing, coordinating and focusing the value adding network. Cost reduction, you know, outsourcing our logistics activity does reduce our transactional costs as a result of centralized order processing or more efficient use of assets. And finally, governance. With the context of reverse logistics and supply chains, third party logistic providers have emerged in the governance roles. They've become broker organizations in the reverse supply chain networks. Organizing networks, sharing information, managing assets and reducing inventory. The third party logistic providers facilitate supply chain management best practice and become the orchestrators which benefit the client's organization. 
And that is the end of Learning Outcome 3. Thank you for watching.